morning. I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity uh, to get in front of this particular crowd and deliver the message that I'm delivering this morning is very special to me. Uh, I am I'm Ed Webb, Mechanical Engineering at Lehigh University. By the way, I'm purple, so purples find me, please. <clears throat> but uh, what I want to tell you today is what I kind of consider a boots on the ground, uh, instructor level perspective of learning about entrepreneurial minded learning, developing curriculum for a course within entrepreneurial minded learning, deploying that curriculum, and I want to tell you a little bit, of course, about the student response, the student experience. But what I really hope to convey to you is the impact that it has had on me as an instructor. And so the, the course that I'm going to be talking about this morning is called Strength of Materials. Yes. yes. What some universities call mechanics of materials. And if you're in a mechanical engineering department or a civil engineering department, you know this course. In mechanical engineering curricula, uh, it tends to be the second year course. It's part of the core curriculum. It synthesizes a tremendous amount of mathematics, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, algebra. And what I have come to learn in my time at Lehigh is that we have been teaching this class in an unnecessarily dry way. It kind of naturally happens, but we are guilty of falling into that. And so, to give you an example, in the course at Lehigh, we have a couple projects. And the first project, we gave the utterly inspiring name, Project One, <laughs> which, which effectively tells the students, there will be projects in this class, and there'll probably be more than one. Right? <laughs> Other than that, this project completely, utterly lacked contextualization. What we wanted to do, just to give you an idea, is imagine you have a column, and you have some weights on the column, and you want to understand what is known as the stress throughout the column. And what we give the, pro the students, we give them a problem that's sufficiently complicated that it cannot be solved with pencil on paper. They have to create a computational tool, a computer code, in order to accurately solve this. Now, we knew that the students weren't exactly resonating with this project, but I can use this word honestly student animosity toward this project peaked in the spring of 2015. When we got the course reviews back at the end of spring 2015, we could not believe the number of negative comments that were made about Project One. One student, this is stuck in my head and I don't think it'll ever go away, one student actually wrote, the only thing that Project One taught me was how to sit in front of a computer and get frustrated. Now, we are all passionate about education. We are all passionate about engineering education, STEM education. We know when something that we're doing works, and we know when something that we're doing does not work. And at the end of spring 2015, we knew Project One was broken. Now, to give you a little bit more background, Lean, uh, Lehigh became a keen member uh, in spring of 2015. And so in June of 2015, I had the absolute pleasure of participating in what is known as an ICE workshop. So this is integrating curriculum through an entrepreneurial mindset, an ICE workshop. The one that I participated in was at Lawrence Technological University. And the facilitators for it were Don Carpenter, Andy Gerhardt, and Maria Isabel. And if you've ever had the pleasure of participating in one of these with them, you know just how outstanding of an experience this is. It was through this workshop that I first learned about techniques such as active collaborative learning problem-based learning, and of course, thinking about these things through the scope, if you will, of entrepreneurial-minded learning. This word is overused, but this workshop was transformative for me. You know, I came into academia and thought, hey, I know strength of materials. I'm going to teach this the same way it was taught to me 700 years ago, and that's what I set out doing. And after a couple years, I realized, wow, this is terrible. So at the end of the workshop, I came out with a tremendous number of ideas, things that I wanted to change, but you can imagine what I dug in on. I dug in on Project One. Project One became Aunt Ada's Treehouse. So remember, what we're having them think about is a column, and so when it became Aunt Ada's Treehouse, now what the students were tasked with doing was designing and optimizing an artificial tree trunk that could support what could only be described as an epic treehouse. So their eccentric Aunt Ada, who was an engineer, an entrepreneur, very successful, 
has now decided to retire to a treehouse in the Poconos up in Pennsylvania, and she has come to either her niece or her nephew and wants them to help out with the optimization of this tree trunk. So at the end of the day, the technical thing we were asking them to do was the same. But of course, I made the project open-ended. I, uh, I staged it. I had it take up a little bit more of the semester than it used to, about five weeks, of course, largely outside of lecture. But I did take some items off of the syllabus so that I could open up certain lectures for active collaborative feedback with the students. <clears throat> you know, there's a, a lot of trepidation in doing something like this. Students expect us to be subject matter experts. And when we get up in front of a group of students and we suddenly have to say, I don't know, that can be a bad situation. It can lead to a lot of conflict and it can lead to a lack of trust between the students and the instructor. And really, doing some of these exercises is about sacrificing control. When you do an open-ended exercise, almost by definition, you cannot know where the students will go with things. And what I found in doing this, I went in with a tremendous amount of trepidation. But what I found in doing this was that as long as I was a subject matter expert in strength of materials, which I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I am. But as long as I was, I had their trust. And then when we started getting into these other aspects about, all right, Aunt Ada wants to see fireworks. Well, how far away are the fireworks? How high do they detonate? How high do fireworks detonate in general? How tall are the trees in the Poconos? What animals are there? As we got into these things, I couldn't answer them authoritatively. And so I became a partner to the students. I became a collaborator. And if anything, what I found was it built their trust in me. It instilled greater trust. You know, I told you about the spring reviews. At the end of the fall term in 2015, we did the same course reviews. And this one, uh, there, were, there were 37 respondents out of a class of about 52. Of the 37 respondents, there were 26 positive comments about Aunt Ada's treehouse, no longer project one. One student wrote at length, and at the end, that student concluded by saying, I wish all of my courses at Lehigh were taught this way. Now, I don't think I have to work hard to convince this crowd that the student experience is genuinely and positively impacted by these types of things. But what I found most compelling, what I have found and continue to find most compelling, is the impact that it has had on me. I have become more courageous as an instructor because I feel now that as long as I go in there with that honesty, and yes, I must be a subject matter expert in strength of materials, but if I go in there as their collaborator and we work these things through together, we build that trust to which I was referring. And it makes me more courageous to try new things. And each time I try something new, yes, there's tweaks, there's pitfalls, but as they get straightened out, the course gets better and better. And so for me, it has made me more courageous as an instructor. But there's something else I want to tell you about. Uh, and I want to just take a quick aside. The Keen folks approached me and asked me to contribute an article to the fall Keen zine on this exercise. So if you're actually, if you're one of the statics or strength of materials instructors in the audience, take a look at the article and please engage with me offline. I'd be utterly delighted to share details about this. And if you ever get the opportunity to contribute to the Keen zine, I cannot speak highly enough of how much the Keene staff helped make that process not only fun, not only easy, but fun. Okay, so if you get the chance to contribute, please consider to do so. But the other thing I wanted to tell you about myself is that for 12 years I was at Sandia National Laboratories doing fundamental research before I joined academia. And when I say fundamental research, my research uses atomistic computer simulations. So computer simulations at the atomic scale to study molecular level phenomena at interfaces in materials. This is very fundamental research. From a technical readiness level point of view, you might say a zero, one, or two. Now, my papers get published. I've brought federal grants in the door. I know that my work is respected. But when people in the past would talk about entrepreneurialism, I would just glaze over. I'd say, it's not what I do. I'm a fundamental researcher. I teach undergraduates. I advise graduate students, and I don't really need entrepreneurialism. Now, I look at even my fundamental research in a different way. I say, okay, I'm at technical readiness level one. What will this look like at seven? 
What will be the impacted market sectors? Who will be my customers? I look at my fundamental research in a completely different way. Recently, one of my PhD students came in to me. She's just about to finish. And she said to me, I'm about to go on my first interview in industry. I've done academic interviews, and I feel I know what I'm doing there. But this is going to be my first industry interview. And without missing a beat, I said to her, what's their mission? Because she didn't, she didn't know what they would ask her. I said, what is their mission? What is their bottom line? How do you become part of their organization and become an entrepreneur who will raise their bottom line? And so she dug in for like a week, and she really studied this company. And she knocked the interview out of the park. She has a follow-up on-site interview next week, so fingers crossed. But this has changed me not only as an undergraduate instructor, but as a researcher, as a graduate advisor. And one more thing about me. I have a son who's nine years old. And like any son or any child who's nine years old, he's tremendously curious, asks me lots of questions. And what, it ha what has happened with me is now when he starts to ask these things, my curiosity is piqued. I'm seeking connections, and I'm even talking to him about creating value. I've even been talking to him about being more contrarian in his approach to things, which I got to tell you, his mother and his elementary school teachers, not so happy with the contrarian thing, but what are you going to do? And so, again, I don't think I have to work very hard to convey to this crowd the impact that these types of things can have on the student experience. But what I do want to try and convey is the impact that it has on the instructor experience. And again, it has made me much more courageous. And, and what I would say is that if you are considering going down this path and you have not yet taken the first step, do so. You will find it utterly enjoyable. It will be a wild ride at times, but it will change you as an instructor. And I hope that you will find that, like it has for me, it will holistically change you even as a person. And so with that, I want to conclude by thanking the organizers again for the chance to share this story with you. I want to thank all of you for listening. And I want to wish all of you an outstanding rest of the meeting. Thank you very much.